I've generally known this, but it, that song really brought home to me the fact that there are some parts of the, of the orca and the salmon story um, that cannot be told in scientific reports or books. They can only be told from the heart. And, and you heard that part of the story uh, at the beginning of this conference, and I, I was really taken by it. Uh, it was great. The title of this talk is Salmon Orcas, People in Place. It's a, take, it's a take off on the title of my book, Salmon People in Place. I, I probably could have put 200 species in there with the orcas, and it would still have been appropriate. But Susan said I couldn't have that much time. <laughs> the great uh, conservationist John Muir said that told us that when we try to pick out anything by itself, we find it's hitched to everything else in the universe. When you pull on a thread in the ecological tapestry, you find that everything, all the other threads, are connected to it. This thought or idea is connected to most everything that I'm going to say to you today. And it's an ecological principle that should be on, continuously on the mind of every citizen, biologist, manager, developer, resource explorer, everybody. In this complex ecological tapestry that we call the Pacific Northwest bioregion, I'm particularly interested in one silver thread, the Pacific salmon. And for 130 years, we've been pulling on that thread. We've been trying to pull it out of the tapestry under the <coughs> false belief that we could replace it with an industrially produced substitute produced in fish factories. We persist in this belief only because we ignore all the other threads that are connected to this one silver thread. And one of those threads are the ones that you're most concerned about, the orcas. Most of what I'm going to say to you today is uh, contained in my newest book, Salmon People in Place. And in writing that book, I, I followed or was guided by two, two basic principles that I got from two other biologists. The first was uh, Gary Navin, who is a biologist that works in the Southwest. And, and Gary said that salmon or animals don't go extinct because somebody shoots the last one or we scrape away the last of their habitat. They go extinct because the underlying ecological relationships that sustain them begin to unravel. He then went on and put that into anthropomorphic terms, and he said that uh, they go extinct because of a lack of ecological companionship. A lack of ecological companionship. To me, that is an extremely powerful idea, an extremely powerful idea. And it relates directly to Muir's observation and, and to the salmon-orca relationship, or I should say the salmon-orca companionship. And I believe that Gary, in saying, making this statement, was trying to tell us that our focus on numbers has been misplaced. Um, the problem with salmon and orcas, the declining salmon and orcas, is not the declining numbers. Those numbers are the symptoms, important symptoms, but symptoms no less. The problem is the underlying ecological relationships that have been unraveling. And we haven't been paying near enough attention to those in our management recovery programs, particularly for salmon. For over a century, we defined the salmon's problem in terms of declining numbers, the symptom. Defining the problem in that way inevitably leads to recovery actions that simply try to boost the numbers and has for a hundred years meant boosting hatchery production. 
It's a solution that ignores all the ecological relationships that salmon and their sustaining ecosystems need to persist. And without that understanding of those relationships, boosting the numbers hasn't been successful, as you're all aware. Okay, Gary Nabam's idea is the first one that helped guide me through this writing of this book. The other was from a Canadian biologist, John Livingston. And in his book on Arctic oil exploration, John Livingston says that environmental problems are like icebergs. Uh, because like icebergs, they have a visible tip and a large hidden mass. And Livingston calls the exposed tip of the environmental icebergs the issues. The, the, there are the highly visible effects of human activities. And for Pacific salmon, those visible effects are pretty well known. Dams, dewatered streams, polluted streams, poor logging practices, poor grazing practices, poor hatchery practices, overharvest, the whole litany of insults that we've heaped upon the salmon. Now these, these issues, these visible issues, have all been analyzed in scientific reports and reported in the popular media, especially since the salmon were listed under the Endangered Species Act. And the issues are an important part of the salmon's problem, but like the iceberg, there is also a large hidden part of the salmon's problem. And it's rarely the subject of scientific inquiry and never described in the popular media. The submerged mass of the environmental iceberg that we call the salmon's problems contains the unstated assumptions and myths and beliefs that govern our behavior toward the natural world. In other words, the hidden part of the iceberg is the source of the decisions that create the visible issues or prevent us from mediating those, those uh, visible issues. For this talk and in my book, I call this group of myths, assumptions, beliefs in the hidden part of the Livingston's, John Livingston's environmental iceberg, our salmon story. It goes by several other names like worldview, conceptual framework, paradigm, or frame. <laughs> And one way to, to visualize the importance of, of this hidden part of the salmon's iceberg is to um, think of it as similar to a, the picture on the box of a jigsaw puzzle. Each piece of the puzzle is a bit of information, but that, inform, uh, that information can only be interpreted by reference back to the picture. And the picture begins to tell you how you should interpret that information and what role and place it plays in completing the puzzle. Now if the picture on the box is of a bouquet of flowers and the, and the pieces when they're assembled is of a sailboat on a stormy sea, you're gonna have a hell of a time completing your puzzle. <laughs> and, and in fact, uh, you probably won't be able to complete the puzzle. Our salmon story is the picture that we carry around in our heads of, of the uh, salmon sustaining ecosystems. And it helps us interpret this steady stream of pieces of information about the salmon that we then try to put together to, in this thing that we call the salmon management and recovery puzzle. And if that picture that we carry around in our heads isn't uh, consistent with the latest science, is based on false assumptions, um, then we're going to have a heck of a time put, taking all these pieces of information that are coming into us from science, from songs, from all, all, all kinds of areas, we're going to have a heck of a time assembling those into a coherent salmon management and recovery program. Because as the linguist George Lakoff tells us, if uh, fact 
conflicts with the story, the story will stay, the fact will go. And if the orcas are not part of our salmon story, in a, in a truly meaningful way, their impoverished state won't be recognized, their impoverished state won't be taken into account when we assemble the, the salmon management and recovery puzzle. Okay, those are the two ideas that I've kept in my, my head as I wrote this book, and I'm going to be talking about them here today. Um, the first, I, I want to take a little bit of time to uh, talk about this story business. Humans have been telling salmon stories for thousands of years, and those stories help explain the source of the salmon's abundance, define the terms of the human-salmon relationship, and set the rules that govern our behavior towards these magnificent animals. The theologian and environmentalist Thomas Berry tells us that our biggest crises occur when our stories no longer protect the things we value. And so it should be obvious that our story, our story is involved in this current salmon crisis because it did not protect the regional icon, this, this animal that we that value so much. When I think about the differences in salmon stories between the Native Americans and Euro-Americans, two images come to mind. One is of the whole tribe turning out to celebrate the uh, year's first salmon returning to the river. They treat the salmon with great deference, and after the salmon is eaten, the bones are carefully returned back to the river. The other image is of a cannery worker shoveling rotted salmon carcasses off the dock into the river. And before the collapse of the large salmon runs, fishermen often caught more salmon than the cannery could process, leaving many on the dock to spoil. To achieve maximum efficiency, canneries often bought more salmon than they could process because they did not want any lapses in the canning process if uh, they had run out. So in this talk, I want to explore the salmon story that led to the latter image. To do that, we need to go back to the dawn of the industrial salmon fishery in the closing decade of the 19th century. Now, when Euro-Americans arrived in the Pacific Northwest, they found an entrepreneur's dream. They found a, a fish in huge abundance, the flesh of which uh, remained good in the can for years. The timing of the runs were fairly uniform, so they knew when they had to have the cannery machinery ready, the boats repaired, the nets mended, and the supply of cans. And the uniform size of the salmon quickly led to automatic butchering machines, which allowed them to convert the salmon to cash at faster and faster rates. Salmon easily made the transition from the subsistence economy of the Native Americans to the industrial economy of the newcomers. The cannery owners and managers were not satisfied with the wild salmon's natural productivity. Even though they had no real understanding of the ecological processes that sustained salmon, its massive abundance, they believed they could improve upon nature if they simplified and controlled salmon production. In the late 19th century, the nation was rapidly converting to an industrial economy. So, so the managers looked in that direction for a solution to their production problem that they thought they had. They had already, they had already industrialized the utilization of the adults. So they looked to the other end of the life cycle and they industrialized reproduction through the use of fish hatcheries or to underscore their industrial genesis, those early fish hatcheries were called fish factories. The fish factories allowed the salmon managers to simplify the production system and gave humans control over the production, or so they thought. 
it was easier and simpler than de dealing with the messy ecological relationships that really sustain the salmon, as well as the orcas. The author Jim Scott tells us that in choosing this approach, salmon management and recovery were being consistent with the approach used by government agencies that cover a whole range of uh, problems from city planning to forest management. Scott tells us that resource managers commonly create a simple model of the parts of nature that they plan to commodify and sell in the markets. Once they bought into the hatchery uh, idea in the late 1870s, management agencies quickly came to rely on hatcheries and harvest regulation as the two primary management tools. And from this, a very simple management model emerged. Hatcheries would supply fish to the fisheries. The fisheries would be regulated to get enough fish back to keep the cycle going. The simplified model of the salmon production system gave the illusion that production of salmon commodities was under complete control of the manager. And this model of an industrialized production system that treated salmon as a commodity is the basic outline of our story. The story that failed to protect the salmon and the story that currently is failing to recover salmon. But this simple model had a lot of appeal. It eliminated all the messy ecological relationships. For example, life history diversity is the salmon solution to problems of survival in, in a complex matrix of uh, different kinds of habitats and fluctuating environments. Life history diversity can be thought of as a network of spatial and temporal pathways through the freshwater habitats the salmon must occupy to complete their life cycle. Diverse life histories are the salmon's way of not putting all their eggs in one survival basket. In the hatchery life history diversity, which is an important evolutionary legacy for the salmon, becomes a detriment because all the fish in the hatchery have to do the same thing at the same time to achieve economic efficiency. The hatchery has only one spatial temporal pathway, one, eggs, one basket to put all the eggs in. Simplifying the salmon's production system excluded consideration of other species like the orca, the bears, the eagles, and many others that depend on the salmon's movable feast as it moves through its extended ecosystem. So we superimpose this simple model onto the real rivers, the real salmon populations, and their sustaining webs of ecological relationship with devastating effects. Some rivers like the Sacramento and the Columbia have come to look like the model. We've pursued it so aggressively. And most of the rivers returning to those, uh, most of the salmon returning to those rivers are under human control. They are produced in hatcheries. And so, in a sense, we've been successful. But that success came at a high price because the actual numbers of fish coming back to those rivers on the, on the sustained basis is a small fraction of what was there historically. What seems to be lost in this compulsive need for simplification is that you can simplify and industrialize salmon production and ignore ecological processes that make up salmon ecosystems. But eventually, eventually the things that you've ignored will return and extract a high price. And it may very well be that the diminished numbers of orcas is part of the price that's being paid for that simplified production system. We need a new story that is at its heart biological and not industrial, a story that treats salmon as a living resource, not simply a commodity, 
a story that expresses ecological rather than economic values, and a story that includes salmon, salmon and their ecological companions like the orca. But the current story defines the Salmon Management Agency's comfort zone. They're very comfortable there, and it's going to take a huge effort on your part to make sticking with the status quo more uncomfortable than any of the ecological alternatives that might be available to them. I want to conclude with a uh, few words about place, which is in the title of my new book. And place is more than a collection of things, rivers, mountains, valleys, salmon runs, highways, things that we simply pass by and take for granted on our daily routines. Place is our habitat. And now we may sometimes think that we're separate from place, we're separate from our habitat, but place is our habitat, and it's the habitat we share with all the other inhabitants of this bioregion, including the orcas and all the plants and animals. Gary Naban and John Muir tell us that place is not just these things, but place is also the relationship among all those citizens and things within our bioregion. And sense of place is a deep understanding of those relationships. Such a deep understanding of the relationships among all the inhabitants of the places where we live, the place that we call our habitat, is more than an accumulation of scientific facts. It's also being able to, like the quote from The Little Prince, see and value those relationships from the heart, like the song you heard at the beginning of this uh, program. When we can do that, orcas and salmon will be on the path to recovery. And that's... <laughs>